basically, well, let me just then talk a little bit about it, yeah, and then we uh, and then we uh, we can discuss this. So basically, what well, to repeat again what we have been doing. So the, the the theme is to ask what does it mean to say that being is in some sense process or movement. Um, that's the topic. And, uh, and we started by talking about what does it mean to ask this question of being, what's the relation between being and truth, being, being and nothingness, being and, and, and becoming, being and, and uh, uh, all. Sein und so on. And uh, then we looked at Bloch's text, well, you, you weren't here for that, but we quite intensively read Bloch's text on the dialectical method, the election mm-hmm. methode from subject object, uh, and that was very good, because that is a one approximation to thinking about being as, as becoming. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Uh, so we talked about um, this beginning of the logic, Hegel's logic, sein und nichts are the same, pure abstract being and pure abstract nothingness are the same, and there is then a dialectical movement from one to the other, and that's becoming. And so Hegel develops this idea of becoming as a kind of dialectical relation between being and nothing. Um, so we looked a little bit at how Bloch makes that into a materialist notion of becoming. And then I said, well, in order to make uh, our thinking about what it means to understand being in terms of becoming, to make that a more, uh, to, to give that a bit more depth, uh, and then to prepare ourselves for us going into this comparison of, let's say, Eastern philosophies, Tao Te Ching and Whitehead's process philosophy, see how these two things relate. We need to think a little bit deeper about truth. We need to think about uh, what the nature of truth is as, in a way, the relation between uh, being and thinking, Sein und Denken. Um, and because that is also, in a sense, um, a becoming, mm. not uh, in the sense in which uh, uh, Hegel's becoming Vienna is a relation between being and nothing, but uh, in a different sense, there is a becoming going on there. And um, that's why I said we'll do that by by taking um, some of the ideas in Heidegger's From Wesen der Wahrheit where this becomes clear and to a certain extent um, and then we'll, we'll use that as a basis to go on to the idea of, of process and this is something quite unique <laughs> that we're doing this because most as I said most people who, uh, who write today about this, uh, this idea of process and philosophy process philosophers they don't um, they don't go to this level they uh, see the idea of process or becoming as a kind of alternative to the idea of being as a thing, as a substance. You know, this familiar rhetoric, I almost like to call it, between substance ontologies and process ontologies. And what I wanted to, uh, what I said last time was, um, this is, I think, a completely wrong track to go down because then it just becomes a matter of do you favor an ontology that talks about processes or do you favor an ontology that talks about things. But I think that is inadequate because obviously there are processes and obviously there are things. Even if we understand these things are somehow composite, they're still the things that there are. Um, So we have to take it one level deeper. And one way to do that is to think think about truth as a becoming but truth is a process and that is what uh, Whitehead, oh, sorry, was what Heidegger in a way does in this little text mm. and so that's what I wanted to, to talk about uh, what is going on there, how does he do that and, um, and, and if you have read the text or if you remember reading it you will maybe remember that it, at one point it becomes very very complex and it becomes very, uh, in a way also very uh, unclear what he is trying to say and as always with Heidegger there is the danger that you get caught up in his words I don't know if you are familiar with reading Heidegger a lot but there is a kind of danger that you get caught up in his little system I think that's a real problem with him 
Uh, he's always talking about how other people uh, shouldn't use the kind of language that they use because it's metaphysical, etc. But of course he does the same himself. He insists on a particular jargon that has to be used and otherwise you don't get it. And I think we have to emancipate ourselves from that if we want to make any use of Heidegger today. Um, but we can do that with this. Mm. And so let me just summarize very quickly because we only did like three pages of this text last time. <laughs> uh, but, I, but what we had was Satzwahrheit. Um, uh, uh, so that is, the, that is what you might call propositional truth. Yeah. And I also said that this is not uh, unique for Heidegger, but this is very traditional classical Thomist philosophy. There's a lot of Thomist philosophy in there, as I said, that uh, he doesn't mention, but he just it's basically as if he runs down the tract of mm. classical scholastic philosophy and gives it a twist at the end. So he says there is there is first there's propositional truth, which is the truth of the judgment as his P. And the, the ball is red or whatever. Yeah? And then there is um, what he calls Zachwahrheit, uh, uh, which is uh, the truth of a thing. Um, and uh, here we talked about things like a true gold or true friendship uh, or a true friend um, uh, as, as opposed to uh, Fake gold, or you know, mm. so true as opposed to truth, true as opposed to fake. This has got something to do with um, the relation between reality and appearance. Uh, but it is it is a, an original uh, feature of, of the world that this exists. That things do not always things are not always what they look like. Yeah? Uh, but that's a different form of, of, of truth. Um, and then there is um, uh, Seinswahrheit. Yeah. So uh, one might call this ontological truth. And this is where, uh, where we're now, what we're now interested in. This ontological truth is a kind of, um, it's difficult to find the right way to talk about it. But I mean, it, it is, in a way, a, a, a certain disclosure. Uh, it is, a, a, as, as Heidegger calls it here later on, and uh, what is how that usually translated into English? And Baerbohm. It's, it's an the hiding. Maybe it's disclosure. Maybe the way it's translated is disclosure. Are you familiar yeah. with this term? And yeah, the, it's it's yeah. Yeah. Right. So there is the idea, and he explains this to a in a minute. There is, but it's not. This is not a uh, Heideggerian idea. Such ontological truth is a is a well-known uh, feature from uh, classical Aristotelian metaphysics. It's the idea that in order to be able to even have an SSP statement, a proposition, or a judgment. There has got to be some form of what Heidegger calls, which I think is a fortunate word, some sort of an openness in being itself. So, in order for me to say the ball is red, there has got to be some kind of disclosure of that situation, of the red ball, and of me knowing the ball, and of me knowing that my knowledge of the ball is not the ball itself. That, that, I know the ball and not my knowledge of the ball, and that it has a certain quality. So this whole field has got to be, in some sense, disclosed. Uh, in traditional philosophy, this is called uh, the, the, the measure of truth. So in order to, to see whether the statement, SSP, is, in the traditional term, adequate, so is or is um, corresponding to the state of affairs that it describes. So there's the fact and there is the judgment as is being. And so how how do, do these two relate? There is a traditional in philosophy, traditional 
skeptical response to the correspondence theory of truth, that something is true, a proposition is true if it's corresponding to the way it is. That says, so what is, this, what is the nature of this correspondence? If we say the ball is red and the ball is red, then the correspondence, well, so what sort of correspondence is there? But the proposition is not a ball, the proposition is not red, the proposition doesn't become that thing. Um, and Heidegger said, gives that, that as, a, as, a, as a particular attitude towards this idea of correspondence. Yeah? Um, but that, of course, with, that's uh, Wittgenstein, for example, gives that in the tra Tractatus as a sort of dismissing the, the correspondence theory. Um, but um, the tradition is much cleverer than that, and Heidegger is very much aware of that. This, this as I said it last time as well, uh, in Latin it's adequatio, and that ending, that suffix, points to a, uh, a process. Yeah? It's angleichung in German. So uh, again, it's the un uh, ending. It is um, a movement of becoming, becoming the same. And Heidegger goes on to say, actually, so not, it's not the case that the proposition has to give up what it is in order to come to correspond with the way things are. A true proposition. It's rather the other way around. It has to. It has to stay what it is, and when it does that, it becomes a true proposition. Nevertheless, we get the question: What is that relation then between the, the, the true proposition and the state of affairs that makes it true? This fact is sometimes called the truth maker. Uh, and let's just like to call it that sometimes. So what is that relation? Yeah? Um, of course, and here Heidegger shows a little bit of a, a bias, I think. He says, well, for modern thought, this is a representation. Or in German, he calls it Vorstellung. So something is wird vorgestellt, something is put before us, and that putting before us makes possible to have the statement expressing what, what it is that is put before us. And then he says, uh, are you with me? Yeah. yeah? Me. <laughs> then he says, uh, so, so you might, you, this is just a picture, but you might say, okay, we have the the SSP statement, and then here we have the, the represented state of affairs, the representation, whatever it is. Um, and um, this, this Vorstellung, he also calls it an Überstellung, something is put over against the, the, the knowing mind. Um, that creates the possibility of a correct proposition. German richtig. Uh, it is the richtige proposition, the correct proposition is directed towards the, the state of affairs. And what Heidegger now says in order to make us aware of this openness is to say, yes, yeah, so what is the space in which the proposition and that, and the rep that which, which it represents are gegenübergestellt or are are represented, are put across each other. That is the open. And that open, that is what provides the possibility for this process of adequation. Yeah, is that more or less uh, intuitively clear? Well, there are lots of problems with it, but yeah. <laughs> it's clear. You, you need something, he says, something that is original that we haven't made up as as calculating representing minds um, something that out of itself shows something in itself and only when that is there can there be Satzwahrheit so Satzwahrheit forgetting now for the moment about uh, Sachwahrheit appearance and reality um, is only possible on the basis of an original disclosure, which is not so much an original disclosure of the things themselves, but, but it's the space in which things and 
so being and being and knowing can 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 come to stand in a relation to each other. He calls that the open, and then uh, uh, the, I'm going to say two things. Then in the rest of this uh, essay, he starts to ask the question: What does what does this mean? Yeah? And this is then the what he calls the basin. The, so that the being, the, the essencing, which also he understands in a verbal sense, like the verb, the, the, the basin. Um, there are right of truth. It's and we are going. It is ultimately sign that's science. It's the being, the being, the, 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 the being. Being beings, yeah. That is what. what but there is a complication here. Mm. There is a. This is also the sphere of what he then will call this, the 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 geheimnis, the mystery. And he says, um, <clears throat> what we are, what is happening in 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 modernity, is that we forget about this open, and therefore we we enter what he calls. If you forget about, uh, sorry, other key term here is finite. So he says a famous sentence, the key sentence from this text, the essence of truth, that the is the right, is, is freedom. It's right. What does that freedom mean? It's not our freedom to manipulate the world as we want, to machenschaft, as uh, Heidegger calls it. No, it is this freedom to stand in the open. That is what, 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 why truth and freedom are, are so closely related. If we forget about that, then we go into the irre. <laughs> then we go into, uh, and, then, and then we are not just erring in the sense of mistake, mistaken. We might never be mistaken in our adequate propositions and still be in the irre, still be in the uh, be cast out into the wilderness and uh, and, and never uh, never understand the nature of disclosure and how it takes up, us up into its own freedom. Yeah? I'm going to come back to that in a minute. I first want to remind us of um, how classical philosophy thinks about this whole thing. It's a very important point, uh, because it's not the case, and he suggests that more or less, but I'm convinced of the fact that it's not the case that classical philosophy doesn't see this open. It does see it. But it gives it a name. It gives it a name that Heidegger then later on does pick that up. That's why his critique of uh, metaphysics is targeted at. The name that it gives the open is for. It's getting cold now, yeah? Yeah. yeah. is that the being of beings comes to be understood as their aus aussehen, as what they look like, as their form. Mm. Yeah? And that, that, that's Platonism. Platonism is, uh, is to say the, the being of beings, what, what, what it is that makes things what they are, is the form, or the idea. 
and that is the the way they look. <laughs> that's the that's where it's where it's taken from. It's their unshine or unreason. It's also their their uh, their, their their presence. Yeah? So form is linked to, to presence. So and there are, and Heidegger says rightly, I think, there are a lot of problems with that. Uh, yeah. One of the problems, of course, which as Blockians we are very concerned with, is what, what the relation is between form and that which it forms, the matter. Um, no, we're not going to go into that now. I just want to, uh, I said that last time in, in very short word, words already. How can you use this concept of form to conceptualize the open between the thing known and the knower, as it were? Yeah? Um, so if I, if I take the, the analysis of the act of knowledge, the act of knowing, the cognitive act, as it has developed, let's say, from Aristotle onwards in classical philosophy, you have a thing, um, a substance, which is a composite of form and matter. So, uh, you know, a, a particular human being has a, has a material substrate, whatever it is, and has the form of, of this particular person or, or a human being. Um, and that makes it what it is. There are other composition, compositional dualities in the substance. There's potency and act, for example. Yeah? Uh, uh, but there is a, there's also form and matter, and there is substance and accident. Yeah? So uh, th th these are all very difficult things. But um, forget about those. Forget substance and accident. We'll say more about that. But we have a substance. And the classical philosophical view is to say, well, so it has a form, and it is, and something is formed. That's what that's what the being of it is. Uh, and then we have a, here we have have say let's say the knower, um, and the knower traverses the open in order to to know the, the subject, the substance, but also to know that it, that its knowledge isn't the substance. It's always this paradox. You always have to bear that in mind. Knowing means knowing. That what you know is not your knowledge of it. It's you get, you get that point. Yeah. Um, how does that work according to classical philosophy? Classical philosophy says, well, the the form that is in the thing, realiter, so for real, this same form is in the knower, idealiter, so ideally it is known. It, but it is the same form. Yeah? It's the same form. So the, the knower, there's also angleichung or adequatio, the knower, the, 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 the form of the, of the intellect becomes the form that's in the substance. And that's why we know what we know. Yeah? But in order to recognize the fact that when I know the substance, the knower knows the substance, the knower doesn't become the substance. This distinction between form as it is realiter and form as it is idealiter is, is maintained. And that requires that in the act of knowing, there are two stages. There's first the stage of the angleichung, the adequatio, the becoming the same of the, the, the form of the intellect and the form of the known. And then there has to be a process. Uh, by which the knower reduces, as it were, from the act of knowing that which it put in it itself, which is namely the, the unbleichung in the mind uh, of the form that is in substance. That in other words, the knower has got to include, in before the act of knowledge is complete, has got to include that awareness of the fact that the form here in the knower is ideal, whereas in the subject it's real. You see that? This is what we said last time, this is what is called the reditio completa, the complete return to itself, that is a constituent part of the act of knowing. Yeah? Uh, and this is, comes very close, this is a classical thing in, in uh, Thomas metaphysics, 
but this comes very close to, uh, to, to uh, almost a cat's analysis of the active role of the understanding in knowing reality. So this relatio completa is, you might say, something that can only happen by traversing the open. Or it is, it is in a way, coming to know that there is something as this open that needs to be included in the act of knowledge. That's why, I think this is also a subtle point, that is why for classical thought, the Zatzvara, the propositional truth, S is P, uh, is a judgment. And here, the, the, the end point of this process is S is P, whatever, uh, the ball is red or whatever, or that is person or something like that. That is, is a process that, so, so this statement reflects the Helizio Completa, reflects the fact that the knower becomes aware, of, as it were, of the, the abstract nature of the cognized form. Comes that they have to be connected together, S and F, S and F here. So you can't say the the ball and, and the redness of the ball, or let's stick take another example, the, 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 the person over there, the fact that they are a human being, the, the form is not distinct from that thing. It's not a component part of it. It's not an abstract form that is connected to a bit of matter, and then you have a, a thing. That's how it's often misunderstood and misrepresented. Of course not. Uh, form and matter can only be distinguished rationally, but not really, for the Aristotelian view. Yeah? They have to be distinguished rationally, because otherwise there would be no knowledge possible. It's, it's part of the explanation of knowledge. But, but the relation between here, between uh, form and matter, or form and substance, is very different from the relation uh, that's made explicit in the judgment that is human being, SSP. So here, form becomes something abstract, which can be predicated of uh, a subject. Yeah, I don't think that's entirely, I put that entirely clear, but what I'm trying to say is that um, this process culminates in a judgment. And it's the judgment that is true or false, as the case may be. But you remember, so, so you see now that the, the, the judgment that the knower in the end makes, that is a human being or a ball of red or whatever, um, is carries within itself this whole process of going through the, the open, as it were, and becoming, becoming the same as the form and the thing, and going back real, you know, to, to abstract your own, your own part in that process from it. So for the classical philosophy, truth has to end in a judgment. And precisely the fact that, that it is a judgment, precisely the fact that uh, by this Revisio Completa, we know that S is P is not, the, is not the same kind of relation as the relation, let's say, between, between substance and an accident, or a property, let's call it property. So you might say the ball is red. In reality, that's the same sort of, classical philosophy says it's the same sort of relation as the ball is red in the proposition. But it's entirely different. The relation between the substance and an accident is a metaphysical one. It's ontological. You cannot abstract the substance from its accidents. Aristotle says that quite clearly. You can, and that, but, but the critique, do you see this? The critique of Hume, the concept of substance, this classical critique that went into all, the whole of modern philosophy, is to say, yeah, if you list all the accidents, all the properties of something, then well, there's nothing left for the thing itself. But Aristotle would say, well, that exactly, of course, yeah, because of, it's a metaphysical relationship. It's not a relationship between two concepts. Mm -hmm. Because here, then, that go, if you list all the, the predicates, then, yeah, there's nothing left for the substance, for, for the subject. Yeah? But this is not the case. Of course, yeah. But here, the relation between the, sub the substance and the accident, the, sub the substance and the property, is a very completely different one. In a way, the property goes all the way down. The, the, the ball itself is red. 
it's, it's really red, you know, red as belongs to it, properly. Um, this, this distinction, what I would like to call the distinction between the metaphysical and the logical uh, SP structure, yeah, is the result of the Revitio Completa, is the result of the traversing the open, and, and is very much part of, uh, of, of classical philosophy. This is the whole difference between metaphysics and logic. Yeah? This is also why Aristotelian thought is realist. This is why, for, for classical philosophy, the problem of the, the bridge between the consciousness and the world, the, this Ding and Sieg problem, does not arise. Yeah? It, doesn't, it just doesn't arise. Um, uh, this, is, this is where Hegel sort of makes things worse, yeah? <laughs> uh, that is his habit. It's his habit, yeah? <laughs> I remember I, I used to tell the story of, of my supervisor who once said to me, like when he would give sort of very nasty giving feedback, he said, yeah, my dad once told me uh, when I was a child, he said, when I was a child, I once came to my father and, and I cleaned a um, vase of flowers that had gone off. And uh, this smell of water, water of dead flowers on your hands is very penetrating, you can't get it off. So he said, I asked my father, my hands are stinking with dead flowers, how can I get the stench off? And he said, why don't you stick them in a bucket of shit? <laughs> it's, a very <laughs> it's a very nasty comment. We could also say from the, from the frying pan into the fire. Um, but you see that Hegel, in his, in his trying to equate the metaphysical and the logical, yeah, you could say, and this is, I think, what, what Heidegger would probably say, Hegel, Hegel's philosophy is based on forgetting the open on forgetting or ignoring the open and then trying to reflect yourself out of the problem of the Kantian bridge, the, mm. the, the, the dilemma of the, of the thing in itself. Yeah? Uh, so he's, he makes it worse. He, he, he should have backtracked and seen that there is this open, but that the fact that classical philosophy understands it as form in order to make sense of the act of knowing as not identical with the known, but still reaching the known, uh, that that sets sets philosophy off on the wrong track, and we have to we have to we have to to resist the temptation to think of this open as something that mediates, mm -hmm. as something that somehow links things up. Yeah? It has to be. We have to think about it in a different way, uh, and that is what he does with uh, the disclosure with Enbergung and Verbergung. And with, with this idea that this open is the space of freedom. It's an ontological freedom, which, which translates into, uh, into what you call sinus, uh, so letting be. So being able to let things be. That is. Uh, that is uh, but, okay, so. Yeah? You might say, yeah, okay, but, but um, I, probably that's what I would say. There's a lot of truth in this. I would like to, I would like to submit that there's a lot of truth in it. Um, well, there's lots of limited truth. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, so I'd be interested to hear, to hear that. But, but, but these words that Heidegger uses to talk about it, but you still have to sort of get what he's trying to say. They don't, they don't, they are not unambiguous formulations of the way it is. You might just as well get the open by saying form as by saying and bear. Uh, and I think that when we get to the point where Heidegger talks about how and bear and disclosure always also means foreclosure, and so now there's a mystery, uh, I think you can, you can translate that almost directly to how Aquinas understands form. Limitation, principle of limitation. So, yeah, responses. At this point, let's stop here because then we will get we will some more to come. So, you said limited truth, yeah? Well, it's still the correlation is the problem. You know, the correlation between the form and the 
between the substance and the, and the predicate is still a correlationist problem. And it's in most philosophy, I think, post-classical philosophy, is, a, is precisely about that question of cor correlationism um, and how there can be no real correlation between the, the form and the substance. There's always this gap yeah. You know, there's always a gap that has to um, that has to be explained, and it's not enough to simply say that it's open, um, because the openness itself is too is too vague a description in Heidegger. Although he tries very hard to pin it down. Yeah, sure. Um, every time he pins it down, it's like you know, it, it something slips away. Yeah, um, naturally. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 so you end up. Coming back to a metaphysics, although he does it all in the name of anti-metaphysics, you come back to a, to a metaphysics in which the form then only is a an approximation of the substance. Um, we could say it's red, but you know, you said before that the red goes all the way down. Well, maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's just the surface that's red. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe it's just a cricket ball, yeah. and underneath the red sur leather surface, there's there's other stuff. I don't know what's in a cricket ball, <laughs> but it, you know, just to take it as form and substance is 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 an in, is an incomplete, yeah. uh, an incomplete process. And that, I mean, I've been interested in the last couple of years about this idea of accident and contingency, because of course evolution means that everything that has come about now has come about as, out of a series of contingent events and accidents. So the form that exists is itself part of a process. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so that we then create a metaphysics of this process um, and try and pin that down as well without realising that we're really... I mean, this is... I think it's something I've come with come up with, what we're really talking about is a metaphysics of contingency, is that we take these random, uh, random concrete events, not, I uh, shouldn't use the word concrete, but these random events that have evolved in a certain way, and we then create a metaphysics for them, which is only ever retrospective, this is where Zizek comes in as well. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. That, yeah. you know, this, this idea is in Hegel as well, that this is a retrospective teleology. You know, what we end up with as a form and a substance is, has to be understood in its, in, its, um, in its contingent development over time. And what you end up with then, therefore, is not, is not some end point that was always going to be the end point, but you end up with a contingent end point. And what traditional philosophy then does for me is, in classical philosophy, is to try and read backwards to find the mind of God that has somehow created this process That's to right. end up with what you wanted in the first place. Yeah. But of course what Bloch does is to turn that completely on its head, and it's, and it's what Zizek is doing, and it's what... Um, you know, Hegel did to a certain extent is to say that the end, the thing you end up with, is not is the end result of a process, but the process was not a necessary one. It's a purely contingent one. That's right. Yeah. So it's unnecessary. The necessity of unnecessity. I think I've called it in an uh, article that's just come out in yeah. um, Radical Philosophy. I think it's oh, no, no, it's a German, a, new German critique. That one. No, 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 no. It's a new one I've just done in. Uh, Oh, I can't remember which, which point in there. <laughs> it's just come out. Um, rethinking Marxism. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, right. Yeah. That, that the process itself um, is not predetermined, it's not teleological. Um, and what, all, what, what Heidegger tries to do, and what most post Heideggerian philosophers try to do, is to try to reconstruct the process. Yeah. And Bloch gets around this, I think, with this idea of the if I understand it rightly, it's the dunkel des geliebten Exactly, of course, yeah, yeah. sure, yeah. But it, actually that process is completely dark to us. Yeah. We only see its end results in, in formal terms. Yeah. 
Uh, and therefore, the future is also completely dark to us. We can have ideas of tendency and latency, yeah. but the actual direction it will take is not one that, is, that, that can be preordained in any yeah. way. Yeah. Uh, and so he ends up then at an open system, yeah. uh, which seems a contradiction. I mean, if it's a system, then how can it be open? <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, but that's precisely. But that's because it's a it's a it's a system in in process. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah, and that's the real openness exactly. that Bloch yeah. arrives at, which is kind yeah. of Heidegger's yeah. open, yeah. but but also completely the opposite yeah. to Heidegger's yeah. open. Yeah, I think that's that's very helpful, very true, because that is a way of showing why this idea of a of a becoming. Is is a is a fundamental idea, mm, mm, you know, mm. because this, well, you've said it just now. This open comes back as the open system, which is mm. an open. Be- it can can only be thought in terms of becoming. Mm. Yeah, um, and it's where Bloch comes in with, and he changes the S is P into the S, S is, is not, not yet, yet P. Yeah, yeah, of course, because you know, yeah. the process takes over from this correlation. Yeah, this attempt to find a direct correlation between form and substance. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Now, um, that's right. So, other other responses <laughs> to this? I want to um, just to, to add a few points to it to, to sort of put it back in the context of this this uh, this this thing, but because I think this all is exactly where we should be going. Um, uh, Heidegger talks about the mind of God in the beginning of this text, mm. yeah? and he, and again, it's a classical point, and uh, I think it, it it helps us to understand what what, what you just said. Um, in classical philosophy, you have this idea of the order of knowing, the order of being, mm. and you have this idea that what is most clear in the order of knowing, uh, or what comes first in the order of sorry, what comes first in the order of being, comes le- last in the order of knowing. Uh, because we start to know it from a state of confusion and of not knowing the world and we get to know it mm. and then we come to the point for example where we realize that God exists yeah? um, and that is in itself the tradition says the most clear and the most knowable but because ev- everything else that can be known depends on that mm. but for us it comes last and for us it is most unclear for us it is most dark because we, our minds are finite cannot understand uh, an infinite, an infinite uh, reality, an infinite being. Connected to that is the idea that things exist because God knows them. God speaks in, in the Bible and then the things uh, come into existence or the logos, the divine logos provides the, 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 the framework for the, the blueprint for the things. So it's because God knows the things that they uh, are created, that they exist. Kant also says this quite clearly. God has a what he calls a, a, a intuitus originarius, an original intuition. So when God intuits, the world becomes. Uh, but for us, it is the other way around. Mm. We can know things because they exist. Mm. Um, we we can know things because uh, so we have a derivative intuition, as Kant calls it. We can know things because God has already known them. And, and has created them. And Heidegger goes into that in the beginning of this text, which is precisely this trying to find the, cor- the, the order back, project the, mm. the order back into the thing. Mm. Yeah, mm. I think it's a, so. You could say from your from what you just said that that you can read that in a critical sense as trying to put the order that we find back into back into the, the, the origination of, 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 mm. of, the, of the world. Or in other words, and that is where I think there's a connection, there is a connection with Heidegger. Heidegger says it's only when, when, we, when we turn into the freedom of the open, as he calls it, um, uh, it's only at that point that history arises, or what he calls Geschichte. Mm. And Geschichte is not history, as Heidegger makes a distinction between the two. Uh, Geschichte is geschehen, is is the 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 the, occur, the, 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 the ereignis, is the happening of of, of being. Um, whereas Geschichte, whereas history is 
backtracking the narrative of, of, of what happened. Yeah? Uh, so, so, so Historia is, is not, not uh, ontological, but Geschichte is. But he does say that Geschichte depends on the human being turning into this question of the, of the, of the open, and how, how does the human being do that? By, by asking the question, uh, was is das Zeilende? What, what is being? Because once that question has been, once the human being comes to the point where he or she can ask that question, that is when the open opens up. When, when we get to the point where we can ask that basic fundamental question, that is where an, an awareness of the open opens up. Yeah? Mm. But he says very clearly, and maybe this is why, why he reads form as a misrepresentation of it, he says very clearly that this openness um, is that, that we cannot, uh, so if we quickly understand, we cannot understand it completely. We cannot, he also speaks of Das, das Zion, the, the being as such and as a whole, which is what opens up in this, uh, in this open, being as such and as a whole, we cannot uh, grasp it. And so, um, in the text it's called Das Ganze. Remember that Bloch also uses that term totally. Yeah? Das Ganze is uh, is, it cannot be grasped. It is almost as if he is using the Sucerian idea of abshatum. We only always see part of things. Mm. So, you know, like we, we can never see the, the backside of things. Uh, if we look at the backside, then the front has become the backside. So we, we can't see it all. Yeah? <laughs> we can't get it all. Uh, and, and I think that he's sort of suggesting that, that it's the same with this, with this open, or therefore with being as such and as a whole. Um, we cannot grasp it, and it remains dark. And he, sa- he says that uh, mm. it, it remains dark. And but but realizing this is that is what Geschichte is. So he seems to to imply that uh, once we step into this this Geschichte, different dispositions of being, Geschichte, are thrown out of way. He mm. uses the term Geschichte, which has mm. a lot to do with contingency. Mm. Uh, are thrown our way that give being a, an appearance for us, mm. uh, like form was the metaphysical one, mm. and now it has become uh, uh, maybe calculation or something, yeah? uh, representation. Yeah, representation is what it has become now. There's a, there's a big difference between what the tradition calls form and uh, what we call representation. Yeah? So. Uh, Heidegger would probably say, yeah, uh, if we tell the, the, the let's say, the, the Blochian Marxist story that, that you, you sent just now, uh, are we not um, are we not just staying within this realm of representation? You know, are we not? Is this not a form of, uh, let's say, a kind of calculating view that has now made the point, made the move from deductive calculation to, let's say, a probabilistic, uh, mm. a probabilistic but still calculating attitude. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, Whitehead, intru- so, uh, that's why I think maybe Whitehead is an interesting uh, thinker, he, he introduced this word creativity. He made it up, huh? um, which, so, Did he originally make that he up? He made that up, yeah. And it's now everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's really strange. There is, well, there's, one, there's only one or two occurrences of it in a different context mm. uh, with a different meaning in, in the history of the English language. And, mm. and then he wrote this book, uh, 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 Religion in the Making. Mm. That's where he, int- where he uses it for the first time. Mm. And then it has spread hugely. Yeah. Because it's, I mean, nobody knows this, you know. No, no, no. No. Um, no. That creativity is is very close to Bloch's darkness of the lived moment. It's the, it's the, it's something that is, remains totally out of sight. We cannot experience it only in its, in its, in its products. Mm. Uh, but it, and it is contingent. 
it is not pre-given. There's no mind of God that that knows, um, and um, and there's nothing else than the occasions of creativity. And every and they create their own. They prehend everything that came before, as it were, mm. uh, and therefore create an order. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So th- th- maybe there is. I don't know, but the the. the you see, there is a, when when he tries to talk about Geschichte and about the fact that that that's why he says this this fair Enbergung happens on on the basis of a more original Verbergung, mm. a, a, a disclosing of of being of the whole, as it were. Um, it's only on the basis of that that there can be this Enbergung, and uh, and that's why there is a mystery always. And then he says the task of philosophy. So, the task of philosophy is to uh, to not forget that. <laughs> that's that's really all it is. Yeah, the task of philosophy is to not forget that. Uh, uh, so he says, read a little bit. In denken der Seins kommt die Geschichte gründende Befreiung des Menschen zur Existenz ins Wort, das nicht erst, erst, der, erst der Ausdruck einer Meinung, sondern je schon das gut verwahrte Gefüge der Wahrheit des Seins im Ganzen ist. The, the, the language is just horrible, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's so uh, ulkig. <laughs> Wie viele für dieses Wort das Ohr haben, zählt nicht. Wer jene sind, die hören können, entscheidet über den Standort des Menschen in der Geschichte. Und dann ist es in demselben Weltaugenblick jedoch, den der Anfang der Philosophie erfüllt, beginnt auch erst die ausgeprägte Herrschaft des gemeinen Verstandes, die Sophistik. Und dann ist es Philosophy. So, so philosophy can never have any understanding in the eyes of common sense, because it is, it is thinking this, this, this mystery that is das Sein der Ausorges im Ganzen, mm. this darkness in it. Yeah? And then he says... Um, so the thinking of philosophy is, on the one hand, Gelassenheit der Milde, a letting be in meekness, die der Verborgenheit des Seienden im Ganzen sich nicht versagt. So who does not renounce for itself the Verborgenheit, the hiddenness of being as a whole. And then he says, but it's at the same time, it's Entschlossenheit der Strenge. So it's Gelassenheit der Milde, letting be, but it's also an Entschlossenheit der Strenge, die nicht die Verbergung sprengt, aber ihr unversehrtes Wesen ins Offene des Begreifes und so in ihre eigene Wahrheit nötigt. So at the same time, it insists hmm. on this mystery. It has to let this mystery be in a kind of Meek mildness or meekness that that does not renounce it for it for itself, but on the other hand, it is completely strict in its insistence on it, but not letting go. And then he says, "This is so. Uh, this is, so. Philosophy is is this not letting go of the fact that there is something that we cannot um, that we cannot." Uh, get rid of or organize out of existence or order in any sort of way by a mere uh, edict, a machtspruch. Yeah? And then he says Kant saw this, in, so he then starts to interpret Kant's insistence on think for yourself and, and mündigkeit and think not in, uh, in obedience to anything that's not uh, coming from thought itself. Thought has got to give itself its own laws, he says. He says, yeah, that's the only way Kant could understand it, as thinking giving itself its own laws, but, but, uh, but it's a, it is more a, a besinum, a contemplation on where these laws are really coming from, and that's being. Um, so you see, Gelassenheit der Milde, Entschlossenheit der Strenge. It's mildness and strictness at the same time. I always think that's that's the point where you can see what the attraction to Heidegger was of fascism. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. Because there's only 
the one who knows. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> and right. And this is the Fuhrer. Yeah, you know? yeah. Because he has this Galasna, he has the Galasnite to just let it be, Yeah. you know, to become what it will. But he has this also, this, this discipline yeah. that pushes exactly. it in a certain direction. And I think that is the key. That, that is, is key to that's, that is the core to, to, I agree with that completely, that is the core to the, the fascist, that's why I've always thought that this fascism runs right to the core of his thinking. Mm. Because if you then ask the question, so who is the one who, who will tell us what Gelassenheit der Milde is and yeah. Gelassenheit der Streng? Mm. It's Heidegger. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if you use other words to make the same point, mm. then he's, he cannot tolerate it. Yeah. Then you get the knock at midnight. Huh? Then you get the knock at midnight. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. In the, in the uh, science domain, that's not a problem. In the social domain, that can be a problem. Yeah. So it depends on the people who try to apply the knowledge, whether you, know, you can label someone a Nazis or not. Mm. As a philosopher, he's just doing the excellent job. Yeah. Yeah, he. What? Hmm, I, the problem is, is he only a philosopher? I, I think that's always the problem with Heidegger. He likes to pretend that he's only a philosopher, but I think at the same time he has a very clear view of what philosophy should provide us with, and which is precisely with this ability to allow things to be as they are, but to be disciplined in our in our approach to them. You know. Um, and that our philosophy therefore needs a party or a leader or a, a philosopher or a thinker or a war, preferably a warrior thinker, uh, a warrior philosopher who will be able to, to, to you know, do those. And that's what a warrior philosopher does in, in a Nietzschean sense. Was well. himself a warrior philosopher? He would have liked to. Be. Right, I think he was certainly, he certainly <laughs> thought that he. If you, the one moment in history where he actually thought that he was was when he became the the vice chancellor of the of the university of Freiburg, 1934, the rector, when he had he had this rectoraatsrede mm. uh, in which he is it's all about uh, his relation to the Führer and in which he says well basically you know if if. Führer, lass dich führen. Mm. And for me, for me, yeah. mm. <laughs> I'll tell you what to. Uh, I'll tell you how. I'll tell you how fascism can become a movement in which we can embrace technology. Mm. That's the discipline mm. as as the the, the new uh, Geschick. As this, the new uh, this, this this reflects on this Nazism. All contingent on the horror that took place afterwards. Took place. In uh, war era, people killed. Mm. Uh, but it's just uh, otherwise, without that horror, everything went on before. Just since everything is going on in America, right? Trump has a lot of supporters. So, uh, unless something you know, going to get horribly wrong, say Trump take on uh, North Korea. China, mm. or even mm. you know, uh, Trump has become uh, this abuse of Putin, and then mm. there was some uh, terrible war, even nuclear war. Mm. Then the winner will say, Oh, either China, Xi Jinping, or North Korea, Kim Jong Un, or Putin, are they you know, new Hitlers? Mm. Or Trump, uh, if Trump beaten, <laughs> Trump mm. become. I mean, a lot of it depend, de, uh, contingent on what really happened. All, of, all kind of contingencies are accident, and then you, you know, reach a conclusion. That conclusion is not a necessary one. Just, uh, I mean, just, yeah. So, um, so I have this question about the difference between logic and uh, metaphysical. I got some uh, some inkling about this, and also the difference between the concept between contingent and necessary. So, so just these are the two pairs of uh, differences. So, you as a, a decision maker or as a student, 
you're trying to achieve something, the end goal. The end goal may be you want to make a reason, conclusion, make a judgment, or to take some action. Um, this is your end goal, or you want to do something good for the society, this end goal. But in order to reach that end goal, you have to start with reality, you know, faced with a lot of real world uh, events. Uh, from there, you have to um, use your understanding of what is metaphysical knowledge, what the logic is, and the all these process, there will be a lot of uh, factors, contingent factors. You don't know which one is necessary. So these uncertainties from the starting point to the end point, just full of uh, possibilities. Hmm. So um, yeah, so full of possibilities. Every stage, right, from the starting point to the end point, you will face with um, dilemmas. You will how to make an adjustment about what the logic actually apply, and what the metaphysical you know, uh, concept or metaphysical understanding, and then what contingent factor I should uh, take account into and make them come or foreground them in my decision making process. So in this long um, process of reaching your end goal, just full of uh, stuff, full of stuff. You have to draw on um, philosophers, sociologists, uh, mm. common people. You have sometimes you have to use science, use equipment, use machine, your own body, your own mm. mind, just not enough. You have to borrow other people's ideas. You know, if, when other people's ideas are not enough, you have to use some kind of um, you know, Gadget, you know, some very complicated machines. Mm. So all this, uh, um, yeah, every step of in the process, just make you yourself feel very, very confused. Yeah. So yeah. Apart from retrospectively, you see, that's that's the difference. Mm -hmm. um, you make contingent decisions along the way. We all do that all the time. Yeah. You know, this morning I woke up, didn't feel too good. Do I go to the, do I go to the seminar this afternoon or not? Yes, I do. Therefore, this and this will happen. You know, I, I mean, Nathaniel for the first time, even though we, you know, uh, we've uh, we've corresponded a lot. Um, I met Martina for the first time. You know, there's all sorts of things that, that come out of that. Um, and then what we do is, once all those different contingent factors mm -hmm. have come together, mm -hmm. we then have a tendency as human beings mm -hmm. to try and impose a pattern on it, to try and impose a purpose on it, yeah. you know. So if Martina and I get married next year, you know, it will, it, somebody will say, oh, well, it was fate you know, that drew them together at that seminar and they had never even known each other before. But he said he recognised her and this means that, you know, that it, somewhere in the heavens it was decided that Peter and Martina would get married long before they ever met, you know, and all sort of thing. And children sit around in a cloud somewhere waiting to choose their parents, you know, all this... Uh, or. It's, it's the basis of religion, you know. It's why religion is such a central factor in our existence, even if we're atheists, because it's the one, um, it's the one area of human thought that tries to make sense of this entirely contingent process. Yeah? Um, I was just to say to my students, look, I'm the crowning glory, the end point of my whole family's evolution. You know? <laughs> the generations and generations of, of Marriott Thompson had to <laughs> shag in it. order to produce me. But I am completely unnecessary. If I didn't exist, it wouldn't matter. You know, nobody would be sitting around thinking, oh, oh my God. You know, Martina would see me thinking, oh, why isn't Peter here? He doesn't exist. You know, so what, 
what we do as human beings and what Heidegger does, I think, tries to do in this system is to impose some sort of order onto a system which is totally unordered. To say it had to be that way. It had to be that way. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. certainly what Heidegger tries to do because he yeah. tries to say, although we can't understand where these geschicke, these dispositions of being come from, mm. you know, at least we know that they come from, the being gives them to us. Mm. So he doesn't he doesn't have the, the, the pretension of Hegel or so to say that necessarily out of the nature of the whole thing it has to be, be such that we are now sitting here talking about it. Yeah. That's, how did but, it but there is still that, that thing going on. Yeah. How that's did it justify it has to be that way? Does it? I think that's the big problem with Heidegger is because he claims to be completely against metaphysics and yet at the same time creates this completely metaphysical system of becoming and being. But let's Very say point. so many so, so many other philosophers of common man you no know, one um, <coughs> idolized <coughs> his uh, his conclusion thing had to be that way. Maybe uh, I'll agree with him. Then he got it right, right? Human, <coughs> other people disagree with him. Mm. Mm. Sometimes he got it wrong, so other people don't agree with him. This is a consensus or convention. Is there some um, other way of uh, um, ascertaining whether he got it wrong or got it right? Say by some uh, scientific inquiry or something? I don't think there is, you see. I mean, because again, that falls into the old trap of there being just one subject and one form. And that is Heidegger. Mm -hmm. But Heidegger is just part of a process. Yeah. You know, so he's just a tiny, tiny brick in the wall of, of Western philosophy uh, before we even talk about Eastern philosophy or whatever. And so you can look at you know, you can look at Heidegger and think, well, why is it important? Well, because he came up with these strange ideas uh, about metaphysics, about non-metaphysical metaphysics. Um, and in doing so, widened our appreciation or our understanding of what, of what the philosophical process is. Um, at the same time, the consequences of his philosophy were that he shifted towards fascism, blah, 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 you know, all these things. Um, but we can do that with every philosopher, you know. Can you say that? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you say that about any other philosophy? Just, uh, all other the philosophers. Uh -huh. They're all just yeah. individual... <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I don't mean that. But, but, but all philosophers are limited in their understanding of, of what has happened. Um, you'd like to think that over the millennia yeah. um, we have a better understanding of what has happened yeah. and we end up in a, in a better place. Um, but maybe that is just... Einbildung as well. Maybe that's just the sort of yeah, because our you, because, because you could say, how do you know what? what how, how do I know it's a better you know? position? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And we can lose all sorts of forms of logic and and uh, uh, and that's right. And so, so uh, but it's only an approximation. So how do you know everything is contingent? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Contingent. <laughs> uh, but you can't. <laughs> So let's let's go back to one page here, yeah. So just to get this a little bit deeper, huh? Heidegger says, "The Entbergung des Seienden als eine solchen, so the disclosure of being as such, the entity as such, ist in sich zugleich die Verbergung des Seienden im Ganzen, is at the same time the disclosure of being as a whole." Entbergung, disclosure, being as such, what is it to be, mm. yeah, is the disclosure, the, sorry, sorry, the, the Verbergung, the, yeah. the hiding mm. of being as a whole. Mm. Yeah? So I think maybe he means, you know, in the classical era, being was disclosed to us by Sein, oh. sein selbst mm. as form, and Bergung der Sein und Asana Sorgen, what is being is form, or now it is calculation or representation. Mm. 
uh, but that is uh, a hiding of being as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. And then he says, in zugleich der Entbergung und Verbergung waltet die Irre. So in this, in this, at the same time of disclosure and hiding, the, 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 uh, we are led into error. Error, yeah. <laughs> It's a highly error, biblical error, 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 error vaulted. Error rules. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, but it doesn't have to. So you, the, philosopher, the philosopher is the one who, who can come to this combination of mildness and strictness in, uh, in seeing that Enbergung and Verbergung go together. Mm-hmm. But the philosopher is not the one who then suddenly says that, that he knows thus the being as a whole. No, he knows about Enbergung and Verbergung. And you, and you could say, well, okay, but yeah, that's... So he's, you know, he's smarter than God in a way. <laughs> um, do you see that? So Heidegger does not say that, that, that I, Martin Heidegger, knows what the sign of Vansen is. No, I'm aware of the fact that there is disclosure and, and hiding. Mm. And then, and he connects this, this is why this has maybe interesting to connect this to the contingency question, he connects this to the concept of necessity. Mm. So, what is necessity in, uh, in German? Notwendigkeit. Yeah? So, and here he says that the philosopher, wenden is the term, and not is, is, is uh, emergency, or, or uh, well, there's another word for not in English probably. Uh, Urgency. No, yeah, urgency. Urgency. Yeah. So, so you are you are turning into, you you are turning towards. Uh, denote. Yeah, uh, and so and he says this, so so, this this human so human existence Dasein, ist die Wendung in die Not. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Weil, let me just read this in German very quickly, yeah? Weil die insistente Existenz des Menschen in der Irre geht und weil die Irre als Beirrung in je einer Weise bedrängt und aus dieser Bedrängnis des Geheimnisses mächtig ist, and we experience this Bedrängnis, this, this anxiety mm. just now, when this question came up, Mm. Yeah, you know, how the fuck do we know that everything's contingent or not? Yeah. Mm. Mm. So we can experience a kind of an, uh, urgency here. I think, I think this is an urgency that makes a lot of academic philosophers into very nasty people because <laughs> they have to deny it constantly, but it's always there. Mm. You feel the urgency to answer this question, yeah. <laughs> but you can't. Yeah. Yeah? And this is what Heidegger tries to make us aware of here. Uh, yeah. So, th- what is this bedrängnis, this anxiety? That is the bedrängnis of the mystery, of mm. das Geheimnis. Und zwar als eines Vergessenen. Deshalb ist der Mensch in der Existenz seines Daseins dem Walten des Geheimnisses und der Bedrängnis der Irre zumal unterworfen. So, in the extent to which we are, we are subjected to this ruling of the mystery, is also this, is the same as, as the, the extent to which we are subjected to this anxiety of, of error. Mm. Er, er ist in der Not der Nötigung durch das eine und das andere. Das volle, sein eigenstes Unwesen, einschließende Wesen der Wahrheit, hält das Dasein mit dieser ständigen Wende des Hin und Her in die Not. Das Dasein ist die Wendung in die Not. Aus dem Dasein des Menschen und aus ihm allein entspringt die Entbergung der Notwendigkeit und ihr zufolge die mögliche Versetzung in das Unumgängliche. Mm. So. Yeah, yeah, it's too exactly what, what we were just talking about, you know, that this, this process of, of Hiding and disclosing creates retrospectively a necessity. Yeah. Yeah. 
and that human beings themselves then think that they are the kernel der Schöpfung, you know, yeah. Are, yeah. rather than just being a species, a particularly nasty and dangerous species, um, we somehow set ourselves apart as having, you know, macht euch die, die Erde untertan, you know, that yeah. we, we have dominion over the, over the earth. And why is this? Well, because there is this God who's decided to make these people, uh, this, this species, in his image. You know, he doesn't make monkeys or, or insects in his image. Those are just things he kind of thinks up and has a bit of fun mucking about with creation. He's created these human beings who then have the ability to un- at least try and understand the presence of a creator. Yeah. yeah, and Heidegger's doing the, you know, doing the same thing. He's there. doing the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. Uh, and but he does yeah. it, and he's in a way, he like Hegel, you know, he just is, is out of the fire, out of the frying pan into the fire. Mm. It's from this this perspective, mm. it makes it worse mm. because he goes even one level deeper with his play of mm. his Hinut here of note and Verbum uh, yeah. and Verbum. But that's surely what the job of philosopher is, isn't it? Is to make things worse. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And to confuse. And yeah, to, to and confuse. To, uh, and, and, to corrupt, make... and to corrupt the young. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, necessity is myth. Um, that's what you're saying, yeah? Yeah. 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 And, um, but it has to have... Necessity is myth... And contingency has to have a metaphysics, you know. So okay, so, so now we get, to, we get two things. Yeah. Because now we can first say, okay, can we then do without this? Is is this your commitment, or also Bloch's commitment to a kind of enlightenment figure, like let's get rid of myth? Uh, and then you say contingency needs a metaphysics, but isn't the whole the very concept of metaphysics that? Hmm. Uh, yeah. This teaching of us different concepts can be used in the uh, so necessity. You can say on oh, this uh, uh, chemical chemical reaction just work that way, not other ways. Or you can say necessity for a human being. Uh, today I just can only come here. Hmm. Cannot something else. So I mean, the necessity concept can be used in human social domain and mm. yes, natural yes, domain. Yes, yes, yes. And contingency quantum, quantum um, mechanics mm. is different kind of yeah. science mm. from other classical. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, so I mean, if you just uh, pursue one concept, um, um, granted many many uh, other aspects you can get the concept clear otherwise you can't get the concept clear if you don't know what the domains you are situated mm. and, uh, what job or goal you have mm. so um, So but science works. Science works on that basis as well. I mean, blue skies thinking and just abstract research for the sake of it. You know, um, an enormous amount of research into stuff where you have no idea what's going to come out at the end of it, but you then end up with something. You know? um, so it's necessary to do the research, but the end result of the research is not a necessary outcome. Yeah. You know. It, yeah. That's I right. Think. I mean, I think Weiser talks about the difference between the critical school of philosophy and uh, the speculative school. And he says the critical school uh, 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 is armed with a dictionary you know? <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and wants to list the exact definitions of the words, whereas the speculative school enlarges the dictionary. Um, <laughs> um, and I think we're talking here about spe- speculative Enterprise, yeah. but of course it's true that we have to ask how we use these terms. But um, mm, mm. but um, it takes you back to a to t- yeah to, to a joke back. that 
Yeah. A friend of yours told in Lancaster once. It's Which my favourite joke ever. Which is only a philosopher's joke, but yeah. but it's about about being and as it was, um, uh, an analytical philosopher accuses the accuses the continental phos- philosopher of being insufficiently clear. <laughs> <laughs> and the continental philosopher, philosopher accuses the analytical philosopher of being insufficiently. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> I think it's one of the first times and, I met you, yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And very true, yeah. <coughs> um, so, but let's go back to this point, because uh, uh, Peter still had to answer this quite the question. Yeah. So... Um, I mean, or is that just a, is that just a play of, uh, a, a purely terminological question? To what extent you can have a metaphysics of contingency? Mm. Mm. Uh, the, the, why, why would you call it? A, so yeah, maybe that's not a real question. I don't know. And logic. So the logic and metaphysical. Do we need myths to uh, to to survive, or do we need myths to? Is this mythical thing? Is that part of? Mm. Well, all, all you can say is that we seem to. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we we try as thinkers to to destroy mythology, but in doing so, we kind of recreate different sort of mythology. You know, we we have our favourite thinkers and our favourite philosophers yeah. because they take us down a certain route which we think is more. Appropriate, so that I, you know, I prefer Bloch over Heidegger, you know. Um, but again, that's a mythologization of, of Bloch. But um, I think we can have a metaphysics of contingency <coughs> because it is simply a way of creating a story, a unite, a unifying story of these contingent events. And I think religion is a metaphysics of contingency. Mm-hmm. It tries to create a metaphysical basis for what are the contingent outcomes of an evolutionary process, which has led up, led up to, led up to is already a, a part of it, and which has created or given rise to human thought. But I'm I'm not sure it's possible to do. A, to just merely be, um, t- to apprehend the world simply as a series of contingent and ac- accidental events. And I think if you do approach it from that viewpoint, you end up at the sort of new atheist standpoint, the Dawkins yeah. standpoint, that, yeah. that you don't need to explain anything. Yeah. Uh, and you become very dismissive of any any human attempt to create a story is for is for Dawkins uh, uh, wrong, fallacious. You know, yeah. and he can say, well, of course, I, I mean, I've been I've been to church with Richard Dawkins <laughs> and stood next to him while you know while he sang the hymns yeah, exactly. and he knew them off of, by heart, yeah, you know, yeah. he, because he was brought up as good Church of England boy. Yeah, yeah. that's so that's that's one one only one step removed from Heidegger yeah. joining <laughs> the fascist party. <laughs> exactly. <That's> the <laughs> but at the same time, he completely rejects it as a system of thought. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, but I'm not sure we can do without the myths. No, because you might say, I mean, I don't know how far this, this <coughs> is correct, but so we have two, two narratives now oh. in the room. The one is uh, the history of being, how do we, how, how we get where we, where we are and mm. where we go to. And the, other, and, so, and the other one was the story of correlation. Yeah? Mm. Uh, and they are somehow related, um, but they're not Maybe not exactly the same. So, when we go back to the open, um, basically, uh, (coughs) what has happened (coughs) is that we said, with with Bloch, with the radical theory of of contingency, we have said that all previous attempts to... uh, conceptualize this, the so-called openness, 
as a kind of uh, linking our understanding back to some sort of pre-given mm. state, that that is uh, wrong. Mm. Yeah? Uh, and you might say this model is, is the model of necessity. Mm. Yeah? So basically what we say, forget about that, and with that the whole constellation changes. Now this open is not some strange space that mediates knowing and reality or denken and sein, but it's just a space of contingency mm. in which being creates itself. Mm. Yeah? Mm. And that comes very it begins to come, come close to our process ontology. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So the, the open now becomes the creative occasion. Mm. Yeah. And that is how I then see it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it creates its own necessary past mm. out of what White calls its prehensions, mm. the, the way it relates itself to mm. what was there before. Mm. Mm. Yeah. That that's that, that's uh, that's what it is. Yeah. Mm. Um, Yeah, I so, think that's fine. Yeah. yeah. So what happens now then to the idea of knowledge and the idea of truth? Because remember, that's what we started to talk about. Yeah? That's what it always was about. Yeah? yeah? In the... <laughs> Peter. <laughs> no, no, I need to go to the loop. <laughs> <laughs> that's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> the... Unnecessary. Necessary truth, yeah. In the process... In that process, there is uh, the so you, you this result yeah increasingly uh, be, become divorced from the uh, being yeah but isn't it true in this process uh, also you create a new kind of a new being yeah of course yeah uh, some form. Uh, bear some sort of resemblance to the initial being. Yeah. Uh, this new being that formed the substrate of this process we are doing. So in this, you seem to say you're creating a being. Yes, that's right. You're, you're creating a being, uh -huh. and that's a very good point, uh -huh. because to the extent to which we lose this side, uh -huh. this of course changes. This yeah. is no longer simply the intellectual correspondence of this, yeah. this becomes a creation yes. of a reality. Uh -huh. And it, and you are right maybe uh -huh. to suggest that it takes on the form of that. Uh -huh. So uh, you might say uh -huh. this in the classical philosophy this yeah. is this is the uh, form uh -huh. create mediates yeah. is a realm in which you can have this side and this side. In the modern philosophy, uh -huh. uh, this is what we call the object, uh -huh. and this is what we call the subject. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. And as high level we can say, well, that's, that's a kind of very, very leading uh, yeah. interpretation. Yeah. Now we lose the object side. Yeah. Yeah. Are we then left just with the subject? No, that can't be. Mm -hmm. yeah. We are left with something that creates itself some, something that doesn't follow God, mm -hmm. but something that creates itself mm -hmm. out of nothing, yeah. and that creates the whole world that mm -hmm. it relates to with it, in yeah. the act of, of coming about, in the act of becoming. Mm -hmm. uh, and Whitehead calls this mm -hmm. occasion, or actual entity, or event, yeah? So the question was, if we lose that one side, then does not the other side change as well? Mm -hmm. There's no, no longer now simply an intellectual correspondence with the reality, but it, it becomes creation of reality. Yeah. It's also no longer just a subject in the, in the modern sense of the word. Of the word. And Whitehead calls it, it has this thing, I mean, which he calls the reform subjectivist principle. <laughs> uh, which is the idea that, that the actual entity, so that the actual that exists, is uh, 
is not a subject of a pre-given world, but is, uh, has the nature of experience in the sense that it, it is a center in which it, it brings together whatever was there before in its own unique uh, creation. And so he, he uses the term that superject. It throws itself up out of its creative activity, as it were. Yeah. yeah, there's another term for it that comes from biology, which is autopoiesis. Yeah, this is exactly the same, this is exactly yeah. the same thing. Yeah? So this autopoiesis and of course we did so much that. Autopoiesis, this concept, yeah. autopoietic concept is uh, used by philosophers, continental philosophers. Mm. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, course, and, and as one no, no. says, this is, this is just Spinoza's idea of the, the causa soup. Or something that is its own cause. But um, even this kind of uh, um, theorizing is much more uh, true in the domain of human social domain, but can't be true in the domain of physical or chemical science. Because whatever new discovery is made is always in the world. Mm. Yes, yeah. scientific domain. But in social domain, whatever new discovery is recognized is now probably not in the world. It's because the human society recognizes new kind of experience, mm. new kind of life. Mm. Yeah, so the, the, the question is to what extent is this anthropomorphic? Yeah. Yeah? Yes. Well, uh, if, if anything of what we've said now is true, it can't be. I mean, that, that was the whole point of it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, the idea that science describes the world as it is mm -hmm. has got to be reinterpreted, mm -hmm. not in a constructivist way, in the sense that truth is just what we make of it, but in some other way. Uh, which uh, in which we and that's a, is very that highly does the same thing as I'm inside through our experience of ourselves as as autopoetic we come to understand that so Whitehead doesn't say that there is only a subject there are many superjects. And there's no problem in us knowing other superjects. So there's no problem in one occasion relating really to another occasion, either knowing it or in some sort of causal influence or whatever. Um, this leads directly to the problem of time, huh? how, how events are connected in time. But um, and, and this is the, that's why, why, Whitehead's, why, why process philosophy is maybe one of the reasons why it's important, because it doesn't withdraw, as Kant has done maybe, and uh, into the, the subject side. No, it is, it is realist in the sense that the whole world is a, is a constellation of these uh, superjects, mm. and there are many of them. So yeah? superjects, uh, do they re re refer to human beings, or uh, uh, no, imagined human beings, or possible human beings? A human oh, being, a do human they refer to some real no, object, non-human, no? A human, human being. being is a superject, but, but also uh, a molecule or a, mm -hmm. a quantum vibration. But, so they refer to anime kind of uh, entity, not this uh, nonsense. Everything is, uh, so one of the consequences of that particular philosophy is that everything is animated mm -hmm. yeah? um, and, and just as just as the but this will concern us next time maybe just as the old theory of the form mm -hmm. as a medium by which the knower knows the object mm -hmm. is comes back in a reinterpreted form in, in the theory of the superjects mm -hmm. in, the, in the theory of prehension which is a kind of realist notion of form, but not in a metaphysical sense, mm -hmm. or in a classical metaphysical sense. Mm -hmm. So the idea of, of hylozoism, mm -hmm. 
the idea that matter is alive, which is an Aristotelian notion, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. comes back in, in the notion of autopoiesis. Yeah. So there, is, there are interesting, it's almost as if, uh, from this point of view, it puts classical philosophy right, mm. but, but takes the, 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 the realist dynamics from mm. it. Mm. Yeah. This yeah. is a paradox. Well, well, it's not. It's even, not. It even, is. Sorry. Sorry. Go on. Even for the metaphysics of contingency, you so you can say, yeah, I am the crowning glory of of the causal chain that led to me, but but suppose that it had been cut off before I was born, mm. then that causal chain up to that point would still be real. Yeah. It doesn't exist only because I prehend it. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, the when it becomes metaphysics is when you put the necessity of the next step in yeah. uh, as a necessity. Yeah. You know, that, yeah. that I am at the end point of this chain of, of being. Yeah. You know, um, and that somehow I always was intended as the yeah. next step in this yeah. chain of being, yeah. Yeah. rather than just being the contingent autopoietic superject of this chain of being. Exactly. And what I think, to go back to your first point about this, diff you know, the openness, uh, if you do away with the first categories, um, then the openness becomes, is, is autopoiesis. That's yeah, all it, that's, that's all it exactly. is. Exactly, it's creativity. Yes, yeah. creativity and autopoiesis. Yeah, yeah. That's, um, that's what I mean, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And that, yeah. you know, yeah. we have no idea what... And, and then... Another consequence of that is, in terms of Heidegger, is that ontological difference then disappears. Mm. So you no longer have a difference between Sein and Zionness. Mm. Because the only function of that difference is to emphasize the point that Zionness stands in the open. Mm. But with the theory of autopoiesis, every occasion of being is openness. Yeah, exactly. It, it is what it makes of itself. Yeah. It, and is unfinished. As and well. is unfinished. Yeah. yeah, it is the open. So, but Whereas it's classical been, philosophy is all is always about finished categories. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. So the occasion, as we're going to call it from now on, is the open. We have turned that schema around. Yeah. By this by the metaphysics of contingency, you can you can change that schema so you see that it is the open. The distinction between Zion and Zionist is no longer uh, is itself based on on the, this religious uh, instinct, mm. as it were, to create mm. this this order yeah, mm. that isn't there. Um, or rather, an order that is there, as in your scientific examples, mm -hmm. you know, in chemistry, only this element and that element working together create. You know, another element or whatever. But the order that is there is itself the product of a process. You know, the chemical elements themselves are, you know, um, or some. I, I, I suppose some of them pre-exist in the sense that they were made during the Big Bang, <laughs> and then over time, the autopoietic process has created. Um, out of those different elements that, cre that, were, that were created at that point in the Big Bang, they've created new elements out of them. And as I understand it, that's how it works, isn't it? That not all the different chemical elements that exist now have always existed, mm -hmm. but that there is this process of coming into being of new, of new elements and matter itself then. Yeah. becomes an open process. Yeah. And that's, that's Bloch's point, going back to Aristotle. That's right, exactly. Is that matter is itself only potential, yeah. potential. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, electrons, for example, they were originated right after the Big Bang. So they are... I once did a class with one of Whitehead's students who became a famous philosopher for Lewis Ford. And one point he was talking about electrons, and I had to laugh so hard, he said... Yeah, electrons are tough little creatures. <laughs> <laughs> because they are they are like fifteen billion years old, oh. you know. This is this a fifteen billion years old creating at the beginning of the big bang. 
didn't really happen. How did you know? I mean, I, well, that's what we know so far. But there are other theories that it's a big bounce and that eternity is made up simply of a series of big bangs of expansions and contractions. And we find it very easy to project yeah. infinity forwards. Yeah? We, we, can, we can project that, you know, that there is eternal time ahead of us. We find it more difficult to project it backwards <laughs> and that there's infinite time and eternity behind us as well. Yeah. Yeah, whereas for Aristotle that was that was quite clear that it had yeah. to be that way. Yeah. 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 Um, Schopenhauer links an interesting argument to this. He says, if that's the case, then we know that it'll never get any better than it is now. Yeah. Because it would have already happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to add one thing and then we stop now. So we have we have um, uh, used the concept of truth or the reflections on truth that Heidegger has given us to sink to an altogether deeper level of uh, reflection than might otherwise be possible, but at the same time we've, we've turned that schema around to find the open back as a constituent dimension of, of being themselves, yeah? mm-hmm. which, which has now changed. Uh, so that is, we might call that the superject principle or reform subject principle. I mentioned last time uh, um, why it also has what we call the ontological principle and uh, yeah, recently I've been thinking a lot about this because I think it has become clear to me only now how important it is. Mm-hmm. But uh, all these superjects, these occasions, they are not um, abstract entities or something like that. They are concrete, real existence. Mm-hmm. So uh, and that for 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 I that was very important. He formulates that principle by by saying, uh, apart from actual entities, actually existing entities, there is nothing. That doesn't mean to say that actual entity is the only category that we have. You no, know, we have other categories such as just form and prehension, and uh, but they do not exist apart from the concrete existence. Mm. And the fact that in our metaphysics we have to have something as a notion of concrete existence, the the places where things exist, Mm. where freedom exists in me, in you, or where whatever a color exists in this thing or in that thing, I think that is a very important uh, concept, this ontological principle. Mm. Because otherwise, if you don't have it, then your metaphysics becomes a free-floating system of ideas. So maybe in a, in a sense that is, that is the problem with, uh, with Hegel. Uh, he also calls this the general Aristotelian principle. And, and this, we have to talk more about this next time, this is what I think is the real rub, the importance of the concept of substance. It's not the continuant in time or the, the, the thing or the middle-sized dry goods or whatever it is that the, as the analytic philosophers like to call it, not at all. No, it is the fact that being exists such that it is substantialized, it is localized in this and in that. Mm. Yeah? That there is a this and a that. Uh, that is, the, that is the, the, the function of this ontological principle. Maybe it links, in a way, existence and essence. Many ontology, right? So, what it seems feel like this ontological, just like a subject. Yeah, exactly. That's it. So the, the, the fact that there so there are many superjects. Mm-hmm. That's that's what there is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and there's is not it, some sort of being that does something. No, actuality. Is this subject act, just is an ontology. In, yeah. In other words, we cannot do in our philosophy without. Uh, some notion of actual existence, mm-hmm. actuality, mm-hmm. localized actuality. Uh, but at the same time, we can't go back to a naive realism. No, 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 precisely. I mean, it has to be an educated, it's Dr. Spies yeah, again. It's an you know, it has to be an educated, educated realism of, ontolo- of ontological states. Yeah, of autopoietic superjects. Yeah. Yeah. Autopoietic superjects, a good name for a band. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Autopoietic superjects, but, but it is important. Uh, this <laughs> is a really important point. Yeah. Um, 
So, okay. that so this, this is very good. It was a good discussion. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. That was really, really good. Uh, so next time, we will take as our reading the article by David Hall on process, creativity, and anarchy. And that's when we start to connect the, this, these ideas to, uh, to, to, to Eastern philosophy. Um, and there is a lot there on, on why the theory of events, a very clear explanation of it. Um, and there's also this uh, yeah, a reflection on the, on, the, the, on the notion of anarchy, not in the sense of political anarchy, but mm. in the sense of an anarchic, mm. unprincipled, maybe you could say contingent, mm. metaphysics. Mm. Yeah, that's what it's about. It's, mm. it's a, I, I really like this article. It's, as I said at the beginning, it's one of those articles that makes all those thousands of others that are unreadable, uh, uh, re redeems them. <laughs> it's like in 1978, yeah, in, in the, the journal uh, Philosophy East and West. But I've sent it around already, but I'll send it oh, yeah, around again. Yeah. 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 Okay, right. thanks very much.